Uh, Dan Miller, how are you? I'm well, sir. How are you? <laughs> Good. Where uh, Where are you currently uh, working at, if you don't mind me asking? I work for Chantilly Air in Manassas, Virginia. That's nice. a management and a charter flight organization. Sweet. We also have an FBO, refueling services, beautiful new terminal. Uh, and I fly through the management company for a, a family. Okay, sure. What uh, what do you currently fly? Uh, PC-12 NG, Pilatus. What's the NG for? I think it's next generation, but oh, okay. um, it could be nice guy or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like nice guy. Yeah, let's, let's run with that. <laughs> Only nice guys can fly the NG model. I'm sorry. Yeah, You're right. <laughs> What uh what kind of engine is in the uh Pilatus? The PT6. Oh nice. Okay. Yeah, and go. uh it's a 67P, uh, Ooh. which is yeah, a little bit more bigger than you and I are familiar with in the in the 300. Uh, sure. but yeah, it's um 1200 shaft horsepower rated uh, and yep, works good, lasts a long time. Works good, lasts a long time, nice. So let me start back. Uh, how did you get into aviation? Um, yeah, how did you get into aviation? I first thought, hey, I can go to, uh, you know, learn how to fly airplanes or helicopters or whatever. Uh, back when Northern Virginia Community College had an aviation department. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I knew that they did was because when I was active duty in the Army as an enlisted guy, uh, I asked for their course catalog. And it came and I was like, oh, what, what is aviation sciences? What is aeronautical studies? And I was going, oh my God, you can actually do this. So when I got back out of the army, I drove out to the airport and said, you know, what does it take? And I just remember going, oh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you just, you know, showed up and then you're a pilot, bang, bang, boom. You know, yeah, yeah, whatever. yeah. No me patres. Yeah, omni omni vor. Omni omni vor. And you know, then you're blessed as a pilot. But um, it wasn't until years later, when the Gulf War kicked off, the first mm -hmm. one, that I became interested in flying again. Um, and went out there saying, I, I you know, I'd love to serve in the military as a pilot at some point in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And then took my first lesson in a 150 at Manassas airport. Yeah. I'm thinking now uh, at my present weight, you couldn't, <laughs> even put a, you couldn't even put a thimble full of gas in that 150 and get it off the ground. But uh, uh, yeah, I did a couple laps around the pattern and, and uh, the rest is history. You know, it's, it's been 30, 33 years now. Okay. So you, you started out uh, um, in the military, but as a civilian taking civilian flight lessons. That's right. Yeah. So okay. when I was, in between times in the military, okay. I started flying at Manassas and, and going through my commercial ratings and all that. Nice. How far did you get um, in the airplanes um, prior to going? You said in between. So you were a grunt before and then after? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was enlisted. I was in communications in uh, oh. the Army for almost three years uh, and then got out. I made it from private to commercial multi, and then I did my AGI and IGI. I did my ground instructor ratings uh, and was working on my flight instructor ratings, but then I got picked up for Army Flight School. Oh, nice. All right. You, uh, like Rutgers or like where did you yeah. go for? Okay. Fort Rutgers, go... yeah. Were you commissioned or warrant or? Did the warrant officer flight training. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I went to WOCS, and I'm, I'm not sure what it is like these days, but it was a six-week course, and then all of a sudden you're a warrant officer. <laughs> <laughs> what was that six and, week, What was that six weeks like? Oh, brutal. Um, it was. It was uh, um, okay. Take what you would think the United States Military Academy is, then go to what you think officer candidate school is like, because it's a 90-day version of the four-year school. Okay, and then take that. 90 days and make it six weeks <laughs> oh wow so we would sit there and you know you had to eat square meals and it, your uh when you had your when you got your food at the mess hall sorry dining facility you can't call it a mess hall anymore 
Nope. Um, Defect, your, yeah. your tray would have to be grounded right to the edge of the table and they would come and they would brush their hand against the table and, you know, uh, and you had to memorize all this nonsense uh, every single day. You had to five paragraph off order you had to memorize and uh, very, very physical, um, very intense. Yeah, it was a, a lot of fun. Best, shape <laughs> of life. Best summer camp ever. Yeah, that was. <laughs> Gee, thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. So you rolled from uh, Warren Officer Candidate School or W, what is, what is it? W O. Yeah, it's called WOCS, and then you OCS. go into Warren Officer Flight Training. Okay, all right. And then uh, what was flight training like? It was easier for me because I knew a lot about aviation going into it because I had mm -hmm. done all the fixed wing flying prior to that. But be careful what you ask for because uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Um, I, I I knew so much that it was actually harder for me. Because then you're learning the army way of doing it, oh. and be believe me, there is an army way of doing it. And because I thought I knew so much, I didn't really pay attention when I should have. So, um, you, 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 just because you know doesn't mean you know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So well, there's uh, a lot of. You get, you, I, I should have brought a more humility to it regardless um but, but it was it was um a great experience um mm. i still have super good friends that i went through flight school with that i keep in touch with on a daily basis most of them are still in the aviation industry in some capacity uh, a lot good. of them did ms afterwards uh, some of them got the fixed wing transition in the army and one's actually working for Gulf, Gulfstream right now oh well there you go nice what was your uh, your first flight in a helicopter like? <laughs> when I knew that I was accepted for warrant officer flight training, the flight school that I worked at at Manassas Airport had R-22s and R-44s. So one of our instructors was active duty Army stationed nearby. And he said, Dan, why don't we take you up in a R-22? Uh, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I actually learned to hover before I even went to flight school. Again, probably something I shouldn't have done. And it, and even if I did it, I shouldn't have told anybody I did. Yeah. Uh, better just keep that stuff, you know, yeah. uh, to yourself. Anyway, uh, he took me out, taught me how to hover, you know, and I first held that teeter totter cyclic and the collective and the pedals and. You know what a R-22 is like. It's light. Oh, as yeah. There's a story about that later or if we get to it. But the first day that we were taught how to hover in Hueys, the flight instructor looked at me and goes, uh, instructor pilot in the Army, he says, what are you not telling me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I basically, you know, held the thing at a rock solid hover. Dead. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, you know something that... Yeah. Uh, you're not anyway, all over the place like everybody else army flight training is is very i mean they've been doing it for since the 50s yeah well, and and if you think about the predecessor to the army the army air corps and world war ii and world war one and all that that was it was the army but a little different but it, it, they've done it so often with so many thousands and thousands of pilots you go there and it's it's you're, you're kind of like in a conga line mm, yeah <laughs> I, I, I can tell you that the first moment that any of us thought that we were actually in flight school was when we were in a flight suit we got our vest and our our equipment are basically it's flight vest and you know you got your first aid kit and your radio and all that and you put your helmet on and you strap in pull the trigger and all of a sudden the turbine starts to whistle and you hear the click mm. click 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 and then it ignites and the rotor blade starts spinning and you're going hell yeah i'm here <laughs> this is actually happening <laughs> oh that's cool when um the you said Hueys, it was did you start out in the Hueys or yeah, this is the early nineties. So okay. the classes were everybody started off in 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 Hueys, UH ones. Uh that's all you had. And then at a certain point we split off. There was an OH fifty eight side, the, the Kiowa Warrior side. Um, and it was called the Kiowa. And the Kiowa Warrior was the one that's arm armored up and has yeah. a little disco ball and all that yeah um but uh so they went attack or scout and then guys like me that have a different personality did 
<laughs> uh, either Blackhawks or Chinooks. And we were one of the last classes in the 90s that went all the way through in UH ones. Oh, and wow. then they got, yeah, they got the TH 67, which is the Jet Ranger. Uh, it's, it's a Jet Ranger. Yeah, it's a 206. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, any funny or memorable stories from flight school, either that happened to you or one of your your one of your buddies? <laughs> oh, man, there's several. There's 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 a couple things that come to mind. Um, we had a solo flight in one of the stages of our training. When you're flying in Fort Rucker, especially out of the stage field, there's routes that you go out to the training areas. So it, it's it's again, it's canned. It's conga line very simple dan reed and i he was a class leader we were stick buddies at the time we're flying along he goes holy crap and there's a another huey basically beelining right for us so we kind of do this little you know dip and move out of the way and um so we get back after all this is over and we're debriefing and we're talking to the other flight crew. And I said, did you guys not see us? I mean, we were, you know, at that point becoming larger and larger and larger. Yeah. Heading right toward each other. And the one guy, he goes, yeah, my stick buddy saw you. My stick buddy stepped on the mic, but he was like, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say helicopter. <laughs> Take a basin uh, like, uh. Oh, and then I had a I had a bat strike in night vision goggle training too. Yeah. Whoa, was, tell me about that. So we're flying along and we are a thump. Ooh. And we we ball of us sit in, I don't know if you've ever flown with NVGs, you've got a 40 millimeter tube on each eye. Hmm. So take two toilet paper rolls <laughs> next time and, and walk around the house with it. Sure. Um, you know, do them tape to your head. <laughs> and th that's what night. And so it lights up, but we um, flying along and, and we're like, did, was that a bird? We didn't do any DNA testing. Like, you know, now if you have a bird strike, you send the guts to Smithsonian and do a wildlife strike report for the FAA. But uh, we kind of deduced it was a bat. And I'm thinking, was that bat? thinking we were like a big giant bug that he wanted to eat you know <laughs> <laughs> but he hit our chin bubble and there was blood on the guts all over it and... uh, no. <laughs> so you went from the the hueys and then what what did you fly next so it um in the army and i think it's probably pretty much in any branch or what you get there's an order of merit list and then they determine that there's x amount of uh transitions available and it, equivalent to a type rating basically and they say well all right so many people are getting blackhawks so many people are getting kaya warriors and i got a call the night before they were going to tell us from dan reed our class leader and he goes hey dan um there's one chinook transition available to our class and you're you're it do you want it i was like let me think about that for a second yes <laughs> i'll take what, it what attracted you about the chinook uh, the mission, also kind of the way that the instructors at Fort Rucker would talk about it. Hmm. We were, we'd go to these different airfields all across, scattered across lower Alabama for refuel and training and all that. And we were sitting there, my stick buddy and I doing our cross country uh, stuff with the instructor pilot and a Chinook came in with a sling load and it hovered and dropped the sling load then sidestepped and then landed. And the instructor is just sitting there gob smacked. He's like, muh. <laughs> and I was like, hey, you know, that's really cool. And what do you know about those? He goes, man, I would love to have a Chinook transition. <laughs> so I kind of got the idea in my head. Oh, that, that'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's offered it and I'm thinking it's a one in a million chance. Um, I'll take it. And the mission for the Chinooks is, is really great. There's a so much you can do with it. I mean, for God's sake, look at any movie now that has anything to do with military. <laughs> there's a there's Chinook, a Chinook or Blackhawk. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, nothing wrong with Blackhawks. And, and I feel bad for the kids that weren't as smart as me in flight school. <laughs> 
So where did you do your Schnook training then or transition? When we graduated, we had a little bit of what they call a snowbird status. There's a, a little wait for your class to begin. And it, the transition it was right there at Fort Rucker. It was just oh. a different, different stage field. Okay. Uh, so then you started in academics and it, it usually was split academics in the morning, flight line at, at in the afternoon or vice versa. And then, you know, you did your night vision stuff and then out you went out to your unit. How, how long was the training for the transition? I remember it being three months, Okay, I think for the financial Chinook transition. Yeah. And then you were then um, transitioned from there into a unit or how does that work? Yeah. Once you're done with all that, you can get sent to your assign your your assignment basically wherever okay. you're going to serve as a Chinook pilot and sure. I went to Fort Bragg which is called something else nowadays it's a Fort Freedom or something I'm, I don't know sure where were you assigned uh to and then how did you end up because you, you were in Alaska for a bit I was yeah okay so um, after I left Fort Bragg I went to OCS oh. to become a commissioned officer and then ended up at an Alaska for my first duty assignment. But why did, still, why did you go the OCS route? I was either going to go into the task force 160th. That was tough to get in. And uh, I didn't even actually apply. But my other option was, if, if I didn't do that, I would go to OCS. Because in my mind, I thought, the world doesn't know what a warrant officer is. How does it look on a resume? There's command opportunities. You open up your world to a wider base of uh, jobs and, and assignments and that sort of thing. So I went to Fort Benning for OCS for 90 days and became a lieutenant. How did you like uh, OCS versus uh, warrant officer school? It was completely different. The officer candidate cadre looked at us and said, you're your own company. You have a commander, a first sergeant. You have your staff. So we had this, like, remember Model UN in high school? Yeah. Where the people would debate. We had model company. <laughs> so we, we structured the entire candidate population as if it were a, a running company. Huh. So it was almost autonomous. We ran ourselves. We marched ourselves to training. We daily wrote a five paragraph op order to, you know, this is when you're going to have chow. This is what courses you're going to attend. This you know, And we got to do all the field stuff. We got to shoot things and, and play army and all that sort of thing. So it was, it was a lot of fun. It was super intense. It was neat because then we were thinking from the very minute we got there as if we were in charge of ourselves. Whereas WOCS is you need to stand right here. And if your foot is not exactly 36 inches from my desk, I'm going to make you do pushups. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh so you went from there to alaska or how'd that work yeah uh my first assignment out of ocs was to alaska in a chinook unit nice what was your mission there they, they were we we're called the arctic warriors um the actual name of our company were the sugar bears <laughs> 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 you know it strikes fear in the heart of all enemies right you know here come the sugar bears Ooh, watch <laughs> out it was it was in support of the 172nd. Uh, I think it was the Arctic Brigade. Uh, we did a uh, we had skis on our on our landing gear, so it was really cool. We could land on snow and tundra and all that. A lot of sling load operations, hmm. a lot of cold weather ops. Yeah, there was an infantry unit at uh, Fort Richardson that we supported, which is down in Anchorage, and then I was at Fort Wainwright, and there was an infantry unit there that or several units that we supported but we'd fly them around all the time nice now how long uh, were you up in alaska a couple of years um uh, i wintered over twice and i was supposed to be there for three my son had a medical issue we got back in the dc area because of that and then my next assignment was at fort belvoir oh okay <laughs> what were you doing in fort belvoir it was a vip unit okay. um and we flew Hueys and Blackhawks. We had the white tops, you know, the fancy ones. Yeah. How long were you there then? I was there for better part of two years. Yeah. And yeah. Where were you for September 11th? I was at Fort AP Hill with our company. We were conducting a nine millimeter qualification. Hmm. And I got a phone call from my boss and he said, a plane has hit one of the World Trade Center buildings. And I hmm. went... And I'm thinking in my mind, you know, is it one of those people in a 172 going and doing the river tour? 
Yeah. Got a little off kilter and then smashed into the building. And then it wasn't however many minutes later, I get a second phone call and he's like, yeah, second plane has hit the second tower. Then they were tracking the Pennsylvania airplane and they're tracking the Pentagon airplane. Uh, and at that point, I'm like, well, I think we should probably suspend training. And he goes, that's what I was about ready to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I climbed the tower and there's this Department of Army civilian up there in the range tower. And he's like, this better be really important that you're interrupting my range. <laughs> I went, yeah, I think this probably qualifies. Jeez, I said, yeah. Yeah, it, it's time for us to, we had one Blackhawk, one uh, Huey down there for crews that were on duty that day. So they were going to get their qualification in, but still be ready to go to do the national capital region missions that we had. And then um, the rest of us were in 15 packs vans. So it was kind of comfortable knowing that we had a fair bit of ammunition left and some nine mils driving up 395, you know, going yeah. back to Fort Belvoir. At the same time, several blacked out Suburbans went whizzing by us with their lights on coming out of AP Hill. Wow. So there's a there's a quick reaction force there that I have no idea who it is or what agency or whatever. But, sure, you know, the billboards that you see going up 95 and 395 that say traffic ahead. Yeah. Major event has occurred. <laughs> Oh. expect delays <laughs> oh my gosh we didn't have anything and of course all the cell phones went dead but um that's where i was Jeez. and uh back to fort belvoir to kind of watch it on the news or what did you guys do so we immediately got back and then there were several meetings of course and trying to get people to organize themselves into shift work basically so we were doing 24-hour ops um and then i got put on night flights and then a couple weeks into it i got actually a couple of days into it i got switched back to um to day flights hmm. remember the big flag they dropped uh, draped over the pentagon the big american yeah. flag I, I was actually with major general jackson he was a passenger and his aide and being another pilot and flying him he's like that take that flag down because hmm. it was starting to get all bur like sooty because it was still burning yeah the pentagon was still burning three days later yeah and that flag if I'm not mistaken, it's still hanging in third regiment's headquarters at Fort Myer. Mm. Like wow. two stories worth of flag hanging yeah. there. And then we did recovery ops. We flew a lot of um, uh, evidence. I'm just going to say that from the Pentagon to Fort Belvoir and mm. from Fort Belvoir to Dover for DNA identification. Hmm. Mm. What was it like uh, flying around uh, D.C. during because at the time they had kind of shut down the national airspace system, right? Yeah. The, uh, if you've ever flown in that airspace, there are numbered corridors. If you look at the helicopter map for D.C., it's like Route 1, Route 4, Route 5, and the yeah. Beltway, another one. And so when you're talking to ATC, it's like four to five Pentagon. And you got to say it faster than that. Yeah. <laughs> And and if you know Potomac or not Potomac, but uh, DC Tower is busy, they're gonna. You know, so you come along the other side of the Potomac from National, and you go up that route. But I remember we were flying to the Pentagon a, a day or two later. Said, "Hey, Tower, this is Pat P A T. Pat is a priority air transport. So I was Pat two six. It was Pat two six four to five one Pentagon." Hey, how are you guys doing? I'm like, I'm fine. Why are you having a conversation with me? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you, it's you, Eagle's Nest. I mean, the park police were out. Yeah, park uh, police. Yeah. Muscle, muscle from uh, Andrews. Those are and then Marines, the Marines, right? Fox. Yeah, the Marine Corps yeah. was out there flying and some Coast Guard stuff. But other than that, it was completely silent. Dead. Yeah. So we're having this, you know, back and forth. Like, hey, what's your name? My name's John. Hey, okay. How many kids do you have? <laughs> <laughs> man that um, must have been surreal it was crazy uh, you, you know when you when you think about well just operating in the dc area by itself is is pretty busy and if you've flown anywhere up and down the east coast you know, from boston all the way down to miami you, you know you're going to get a lot of traffic and there's a lot you know you're a lot going on you keep things kind of concise <laughs> yep yeah shortened brevity brevity is uh prioritized but not in this case and it was it was days before they opened up 
the traffic back to civilian flying. I lived on Fort Belvoir at the time, and I was talking to my neighbor outside, and we start to hear the distinct noise of jet engines in the air. Like, well, that's something we haven't heard in a little while. And we look up, and it's Air Force One being escorted by, and uh, I, re I recall a couple F-15s and some F-16s. Oh, wow. And they're in formation, and they're coming to, to land at Andrews. Yeah. And they flew right over Fort Belvoir, and I went, oh, well, there, George, George is back. George is back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. How long then were you at Fort Belvoir? Yeah, uh, I think I got there late 1999 and left um, late 2001. Yeah, so a couple of years. Okay. And then where did you go after that? Korea. Korea. Uh, were you back in uh, Chinooks in Korea? Or? So at first I was supposed to be. Um, then when I got there, the assignments guy said, uh, you're going to work on the, um, you're, you're going to go to 8th Army, which is the Army headquarters there, and you're going to work on the G3, G3 staff as an aviation officer. And I went, okay. At the same time, they said, you may or may not fly Chinooks. We don't know yet. And then the command went back and forth, and we got somebody in our chain of command that said, if they're an aviator and they're not flying, that's a shame. We need to put them in the in the airplane, or in this case, the helicopter, and get them some flight time. So there was a little air base just south of Seoul called K-16. And then the Chinooks were down in Pyeongtaek, Camp Humphreys, way down south. It was like a couple hour drive. Hmm. So they would come and pick me up at K-16 and fly me around and I'd get my flight time and blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, that was the last time I flew Chinooks. Hmm. What was it like flying in Korea? Uh, same as here. Uh, the only thing is, uh, <laughs> the joke was, if they haven't strung a wire between two poles in that valley yet, it'll happen tomorrow. And none of it was charted. So, you know, you had to really be careful uh, doing the low level stuff. Uh, but uh, then, of course, you had to be very mindful of the border that's just north of you. Did you ever go visit the DMZ in Kim Jong? Mm. not not him personally no but yes the dmz um i did when i was first stationed in korea enlisted but that's the other part of the story oh, when nice. i was enlisted i actually got stationed in korea oh nice so i got to see it in the 80s and then i got to see it in the 2000s and it's still there yeah <laughs> it uh, hasn't moved no and the kims are still in power hey you wouldn't expect that how did it change for you for, from the 80s to the 2000s? It, it's so surreal because in the 80s, it was 87, 88, I was there. So the Olympics were happening and the town was the town of Seoul. The city of Seoul was getting yeah, upgraded, lots of apartment buildings going up, mass transportation, uh, lots of television. Hyundai came out with... Uh, their first version of the Sonata back then. And I forgot what it was. Oh, it's called the Stellar. It was a Hyundai Stellar. And it huh. was the first car that they sold internationally and they were so proud of it. I actually owned one. The second time I was there, it was like a $500 hand-me-down. You know, 18 million GIs had already owned it before me. Anyway, um, but the it was just, a, it was like going back into the 60s. You know, things were just starting to get built up and and if you think about it, 1980 wasn't so far removed from 1953 when the place had been leveled. You know, you're talking two, three decades. Then I go back the second time and I go, this isn't the town that I remember from you know years ago. High speed internet, e even back in the 2000s when we were doing 14, 15 megabytes per second or whatever it was, they were doing like 150. Oh, wow. Um, and it cost you all of 70 or 80 cents to get on the subway, which ran every five minutes. Wow. Um, to just about anywhere. And if you wanted to go across the river, it was like a buck 50. Oh. And, you know, and then the food was awesome. The people were great. The um, it's, it, it's an amazing country, uh, but it's we're still at war. And that's what people don't really tend to realize is that it's, it's an armistice. There was never really any end to the war and that's why there's all this saber rattling and rocket man does want to shoot his rockets over us and all that stuff but 
it's it's a crazy it, it, and it's you just got to go to experience it if you haven't been i recommend a, a tour to um south korea definitely not north korea <laughs> uh, <laughs> south korea is much more better but uh it, it's just an amazing place and, a, and a, an amazing group of uh of individuals and a very hardcore military the 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 marines the rock marines are fierce hmm. the rock army it's um there's three divisions there that you know, all of them are just, I mean, they're tough as nails and yeah. you know, ready to go at any minute. But yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting place. Is there a lot of, <clears throat> this may show my ignorance, but is there a lot of interaction between like North Korea and South Korea at all? Or is it just, you know, stay over there, we'll stay over here and that's it? Not too long after I left and I think I left 2003 out of there, there was a peace train that would go and travel from the North part of South Korea into North Korea. And it had, you know, medicines and foods and people. And there was a lot of this, Hey, you know, we're not too far removed from 1950s. We still have generations that fought in the war. Uh, we still have families that are, some are stuck in North Korea. Some made it and safe safely to the South but that are, you know, their relatives that are, divided by politics yeah but uh so so yes and no and i think the younger generation by that i mean like the 20 year old um folks 30 year old folks college students are more open to the peace talks but there's still a i mean it's just like any other country in the world including ours there are very hardcore conservatives that say you know the uni unification will never happen mm. Um, there's just too much bad blood. And then there's that whole C word communism. Uh, you, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's definitely not East Germany and West Germany becoming Germany again. Sure. It's a lot different, hmm. you know, I, who knows? Um, I'm, I went there when I was 18 years old, I'm turning 57 next month. The situation hasn't changed one bit. Hmm. So maybe not in our lifetime, so after Korea, where did you go? Korea, I came back here to the States and was immediately thrust into the construction world. I worked for a major contractor in the D.C. area, did field engineering, uh, project management, little superintendent stuff, and helped build some pretty cool buildings. Um, had a part in Nationals Ballpark had something to do with the Red Cross renovation, helped out with the International Terminal at Dulles, did, did a lot of really cool stuff. And um, then about five years into that, I got offered a, I got made an offer that I couldn't refuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make them off and you'll pay, couldn't refuse. Yeah. So one of the companies that I worked with uh, offered me a job as a project manager um, with their construction materials. So I was a, a project manager for another five years. And uh, it's, it's a brutal industry. Five years into it, we the company was audited by Ernst and & Young. And, and usually that should be the, the warning flag, the rocket's red glare. Hey, something's about ready to happen, guys. And they asked me to write up a paper on what I contributed to the company. <laughs> what exactly is it you do here? What would you say you do here? I'm a people <laughs> person, David. Not just me, but uh, several of us got laid off. Mm. Got the whole severance package. Um, and then uh, that was that. But uh, so for 10 years, I was in and out of a couple of construction jobs, basically. So when you left Korea, is that when you left the military or did you come back That's, as, oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Uh, and then you got, to, you started flying at Potomac. Um, talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I happened to meet a gentleman <laughs> for dinner one, one evening. <laughs> and uh, it's so funny because I remember our conversation vividly. And I remember getting your business card and I'm thinking, and I think I even might have said to you, oh, you know, I don't know about flying 172s around the pattern, teaching people how to fly. And you're like, I don't think you understand, Dan. This is a little bit more than that. That was just three months. I mean, I was working at Lowe's part time. That's after. right. I, yeah. <laughs> just hey, for man, fun. I, I worked at Home Depot, so no, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, cheers to the home improvement centers. I had to do what I had to do. And, uh, oh, absolutely. And, you know, and then by the grace of God, meeting you and, and um, Harry and Brian and Gary and Ray and the rest of the gang, Bugs and Augie and. Oh, yeah. And, and, and every other pilot that filtered through there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. And, and just what an opportunity. And I had absolutely no idea the scope of what we were into. Yeah. Um, I don't think really any of us did. We, we didn't know what it could possibly become. And it could have been much bigger. It could have been much smaller. It was just, you know, not to bore anybody that doesn't know the, our, our story behind that is, you know, when when Potomac was sold with Avenge to that other organization, <laughs> um, you know, a lot happened. And I think, I think most of us knew deep down inside that it was just kind of beginning of an end. Yeah. But uh, regardless, the, the, the four and a half years I spent there, you know, being a platform instructor, uh, learning to fly the King Air, <laughs> shuttling aircraft back and forth from, <laughs> From here to there and there and back and yeah one o'clock in the morning phone calls from some guy captain we need your american express card i'm like i don't want to give you my american express card <laughs> you've got some pilots that are asleep in a hotel why don't you ask them for it what so fun side story on that one <clears throat> so um when the owners of potomac decided to sell uh they they didn't notify anyone and then uh one of them, or, or I forget, uh, came over to Potomac, you know, next door to Avenge or whatever. And they, uh, they were like, Hey, where's Harry and where's Brian? And I'm like, Oh, they're out at Leesburg right now. Uh, I think that was the the part that they were, there was some like paperwork review for the 135 or something like that. So they, they both went out there to Leesburg or whatever. And he's like, oh, okay, well, we're having an all hands meeting. Come on over. I was like, okay sure whatever so i go sit down in this meeting and i remember i sit next to a, a girl uh, Kristen, and mm. uh you know friend or whatever and we we're just kind of bantering back and forth a little bit whatever and then the meeting gets started and all of a sudden like the shoe dropped uh by the way we're we just sold you know we just agreed to sell our company to this other company blah blah, blah and all this stuff and i'm like texting harry and brian i'm like dude um <laughs> they just sold the company and they're like yeah no way i'm like i'm in a meeting right now with jordan you know <laughs> and i took a picture and i sent i still have it on my phone somewhere but it was literally that like it was weird it was a weird scenario and then uh for me personally uh in a week or two after that meeting i hopped a flight and went over to afghanistan and it was like this weird transition period because um Avenge had won the contract from, you know, whatever in Afghanistan. And um, then it was like, we were, we were the boss for like two weeks and then they were the boss after that. And it was just like, yeah. oh man, it was, it was a very awkward time. So could have been, could have been handled a little bit better, but you know, that's the nature of government contracting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't I, I, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Now, um, correct me if I'm wrong. For some reason, in my mind, I have that you actually went on a ferry flight, uh, bringing something back, or is that just Dave and uh, Buck? My trip was in Gulf Bravo. Okay. Water, and it was when that was moved from Potomac flight training to a contract. Oh, okay. That's so, right. That's right. So yeah. Gary and I shoveled it to... I can't say the name of the place, but it rhymes with Schmalta. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, that that ferry so, flight. Oh, go ahead. No, it was it, and and uh, that's kind of to one of your questions. Um, it was what was the most memorable flight or experience that you had? Yeah, and that had to be it. Um, yeah. Um, just it, it was a, it was so funny because it was a non-starter to begin with. We couldn't get the airplane to work right because they had to mod it. There was a transponder upgrade and it broke, and so we were doing that at St. Mary's uh, with a the company there. Yeah. So me, me and Gary packed our bags and we, you know, ready to go. And next thing I know, I'm back home the night that night, and then the next day we tried again, and then it broke, and then we were in a hotel room. And but yeah, that was uh, calamity yeah. of errors. 
it, it, it was, but you know, the, the, the great thing of it was I, I couldn't have had a better person to, to do that flight with. Yeah. Um, Gary. Yeah. Uh, everybody needs a Gary. Everybody needs a Gary. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> uh, and you know, and it went from St. Mary's County to, we had to stop at Williamsport, not Williamsport, um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to get pressed because oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, we couldn't get pressed, uh, in the fuel overseas. Yeah. You, you carried a bunch of it with you, right? Or something. Yeah. We had bottles <laughs> or can they're like, like big 16 20 ounce cans with a little nozzle and so yeah we went from from there we flew to bangor overnighted bangor to not st john's but um goose bay goose bay yeah goose bay to sandrastrom sandrastrom to keflavik keflavik to belfast <laughs> belfast to marseille and you saw the dude in belfast that was our, yeah. our helper right yeah yeah name? he was our he was our uh yeah, he was, was our dude that we'd send flight crews through there. Yeah. Uh, he, he basically an FBO manager. Yeah. Brought you a bottle of scotch or something like that, wasn't he? He brought me a bottle of, of scotch, and then I brought him a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> nice. There you go. <laughs> uh, I don't then, know the legalities of that or anything, but, you know, whatever. International uh, illegal transportation of alcohol. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Statute of limitations is long past by that. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And then, so from Dublin, sorry, I cut you off. You you went to Spain, or no? We we, we went to yeah. We from Marseille, we landed in in Malta and dropped off the airplane, okay. and they did whatever they were doing there. Um, yeah. I, I don't even think that's even happening anymore. But um, whether yeah. it is or isn't, it doesn't matter. It's just um, that's where we went. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, what about that flight was memorable? Other than the whole thing, really? I think the the thing that really stood out the most uh, I, I mean and, and i and i still get somewhat emotional and 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 tingly about it is when we took off out of belfast we had to cross the channel to get to france mm. and i remember seeing i was and i was playing mr geographer for gary i'm like hey guess that there's birmingham england and there's england, there's london and there, this there's this and that and the other and then you see the white cliffs of dover and you're like, this is for real. It actually does exist. It's not yeah, just yeah. It's not just in the movies. It's not yeah. CGI. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking up and I'm going. There's Harve de Grace. Or it's La Harve. Harve de Grace is Maryland. La Harve is the harbor, sure. which, which is right east of Normandy. So you could look at the white sand of Normandy and you could see Juno, Sword, Gold, all the beaches oh, that yeah. that they, you know, the D-Day invasion happened. And I'm just I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm looking at Gary, I'm going, we're in a twin engine prop driven airplane and we're crossing the channel <laughs> and we can see it. I mean, this is, if this doesn't give you shivers <laughs> yeah, and, and get you emotional, um, I don't know what would, but just mm. the, just the experience to see that from the air oh, and yeah. know how many air crews and how many thousands of hours of flight back and forth over the channel. Oh yeah, of uh, of the 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 guys, and I, I don't know how many gals may have done it. Maybe there was, have been some of the war air service pilots. I don't know if they ever actually participated in combat or whatever. But it just it it was very sobering, and sure. great pictures that I have, and uh, I did some video too. And but then um then the other memorable part of that one, other than getting a flat nose tire in Greenland. Oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah you know something about you know minus 50 degree temps when you're flying along you know over the atlantic in february nah, don't worry about it what could possibly be wrong <laughs> you land and the nosebleed goes i don't like you no more oh did you guys lose uh controllability at all with with that uh no and, and it's funny because uh gary was like that was one of your best landings ever man and I'm going, yeah, I know. I was really careful. It was super windy. I don't know if you saw the series, uh, the aviation series about the guys that ferried aircraft over for the Normandy invasion and their B-17s. There's a scene where they're landing in Greenland and they're in formation and the lead aircrafts, it's, um, golly, it's Spielberg and... and um, oh, it just came out recently. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that scene. Holy crap, Yeah. 
it, and they're getting their butts kicked, you know, and, and that's exactly like it was going into Sonderstrom. It was, you know, um, interesting weather. You know, we were in and out of the clouds and then you're going, all right, this is a big rock. This, this, yeah. this, this thing called Greenland is basically a big rock covered in snow. Yeah. Covered in snow. Mo- most of the year. And then you're looking for this little postage stamp airport. Um, and the controllers were great. The, the approach was great. Everything was fine. But yeah, we I landed uh, as soft as I could, and I I could feel it in the pedals immediately. It mm. was just a it was a side to side, yeah, almost like almost like when you're simulating a flat tire on a on an aborted takeoff in yeah. training, and you kind of kick the pedals. Yeah, it was like that, only a lot worse. <laughs> Three days later, with the same tire uh, repaired, we took off and did the rest of the mission. It was fun. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Like you guys had it had to be pulled into a hangar or something like that to heat up, to be able to reseed it or something along those lines. Right. Th- that's exactly right. So, yeah. um, and th- the video I have that is hilarious. There's these guys from, uh, air Gle- Greenland and they, t- they hook us up to the tug and I'm just riding the brakes just for safety or, or sitting there in a the cockpit in case I need to you know get on the brakes or whatever. And, um, and then I don't even know if that's a thing. We didn't really have a policy for this. Yeah. <laughs> Like, hey, flat tire, you're in Greenland. Good luck. Yeah, um, good luck. Let me know how it turns out. The the guys in the tug were hilarious. Your typical Greenland, Inuit, Athabascan, Klingit, or whatever, you know, and, and, and they've got that, you know, I, I'm I'm definitely a native Greenland guy. And where they speak Danish and and whatever native language it is. And they're looking up at me, and as they're towing me, it's like a mile toe to get off the runway to the hangar and the tire is just going like this <laughs> blah, 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 blah. and they're they're looking at the tire and then looking up at me and i'm like go keep going keep going <laughs> <Just> <laughs> and go. then we get another you know 300 yards or so and they go <laughs> and look at me and go i'm like <laughs> Just go, keep going. <laughs> and that tire survived a mile long tow. Wow! And the reheating in the in the the hangar, which had you know was slightly above freezing. Yeah, just barely. And uh, sure, shit, if it didn't hold. And I think that's probably the same tire that that aircraft came back with. When Gary yeah. and I got out of France, um, we took off out of Marseille and we're cruising along. It, it was so weird when we were over France. I'm looking over to my left. I'm in the left seat, flying. Gary's in the right seat. I look over to my left. I'm like, those are some really weird looking clouds. And then I'm like, no, those aren't clouds. Those are the Alps. <laughs> There's the, the Italian Alps. And, um, you know, they're just jutting out of the the overcast layer. Oh, and then, cool. then then we land in Marseille, refuel, take off. And you can see um, the Caspian Mountains in Spain, Mm. you can see uh is it the caspians i think it's um whatever the the mountain range is between uh uh spain and france okay you can see that and then um we're cruising along and then you see corsica mm. and sardina and you're like okay those are the italian islands and then all of a sudden you see this i, I could see this kind of dark grayed out the sun wasn't hitting it there was it was overcast over there I'm like, that's the northern part of Africa. So I'm looking at Tunisia. Mm. Oh, wow. And then over to my left, uh, bathed in sun, is Sicily. Oh, wow. And you know, we're flying along. We're at like, I don't know, 25, 26,000 feet. And you're looking at Africa and Sicily. Wow. <laughs> and going, who gets to do this? Yeah. That's really cool. After Potomac, you were working where? Then a young man named Connor Dancy starts hunting around for a pilot to to take a position at the company he worked for, and, and I somehow got it in my mind that it was a, a TBM job, like a TBM seven hundred or something. Sure. And with Mag, I was flying the M six hundred, the Piper that they had bought, and uh, I'm six one, two hundred pounds, <laughs> <laughs> and getting into an M six hundred for me is not the easiest thing in the world hell it's yeah. hard enough to get in the pc-12 I, I didn't like the thought of doing single engine turboprop 
all over the place. You know, on, a, on an occasion, it's fine. It, it's a, it's a, you know, the M600 is a great airplane. The TVMs are great airplanes, but I just thought that was a little too small for me. Um, I don't know if I'd be happy with that. And then, so I called Connor when I learned about the position, he said, I don't care what you do. Stop what you're doing, get your resume together, write a cover letter and get it to me in about 30 minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I think you strongly feel about this idea of me coming to work for this, you know, your, your company in, the, in, in this position. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, I, I don't know why I didn't think of you earlier. Uh, just do it. Trust me, you'll be happy. <laughs> and uh, so I did and I got picked up for the job. I was single pilot for better part of a year okay and then we hired another guy uh he's moved on to the Gulfstream that the family that i work for owns i, I had four interviews four. my first one was over the phone okay second one was in person with the chief pilot and a couple other pilots the third one was with the chief pilot the doo and hr i think and the fourth one was with the actual family that i fly for hmm. and uh I'm thinking one hell of an interview. Yeah. <laughs> I bought, I bought houses <laughs> in less time. Yeah. Yeah. Pe people have gotten top secret security clearances faster than that. <laughs> uh, and then the, at the end of the interview, um, the principals of the family looked up and went, well, we like you. You're hired. Okay. <laughs> oh, and, and start I remember tomorrow. Looking for the, yeah, basically, and the chief pilot and the, and the DOO were like, uh, oh, "Don't we have? Oh, never mind. Too yeah, late. <laughs> whatever. All right. Boss says so. Uh, four and a half years later. Um, so uh, you're not in the TBM. You're in a PC12, right? A PC12 NG. Yeah. All right. There you go. That's awesome. Um, now, without disclosing maybe specific information. Um, do you have like a general schedule or general route or, uh, you know, is it just kind of like at the whims of the family or? We, we, well, yeah, it, it certainly is whatever they want um, with a reason and the capabilities of the aircraft, uh, the, sure. the amount of passengers it can hold and the fuel burn and all that. There is a pattern. I mean, there's, there's specific places we go to sure. very often, but it's all up and down the East coast. I've been okay. out as far as, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I've been out to been all over Michigan, yeah. okay, New York, Hamptons, uh, Boston. Oh, Boston. Yeah. <laughs> I got yelled at in Boston once. Uh, we were doing a photo flight up there over I don't know Interstate whatever ninety five, and uh, some interchange in around I don't even know if it's ninety five is correct, but some you know north south freeway up there, and. Um, we get done with the, the flight that we're doing and the photographer in the back was like, Hey, there's whatever stadium, you know, like I want to go take some pictures of that with our large format camera. I was like, sure. Yeah, let's go. And so we do a couple of passes. And by the, like the third pass, I get, you know, yelled at by Boston tower or whatever. It's like, what are you doing? Get out of there. You're, you're not supposed to be there. I'm like, oh, sorry. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Boston. Quit picking my apples. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh and, and and that's for i mean you know it, with in the helicopter world you're not doing as much uh, but i mean if you're in a if you're in a busy metropolitan area you could be talking to atc all the time every single yeah. day yeah yeah it, it gets very busy uh, you know depending on the airspace that you go one time i flew down to um atlanta and i was doing an aerial survey uh 1200 feet over the over top of atlanta hartsfield you know the, the big international airport and um I had, uh, you know, working with that uh, sur survey company, I had pre-coordinated with, um, you know, their ATC down there, both the, you know, approach and then also the tower. And like, they all kind of knew I was coming, uh, not all, but they, the people that mattered knew that I was coming. And so I call up, uh, you know, Atlanta approach and I'm under the class Bravo because I'm in, in the helicopter at this time. And I'm like, uh, Atlanta approach helicopter 503 whiskeys, 20 miles North inbound aerial survey over the field at 1200 feet. And the guy laughed at me. He was like, yeah, no way. Not today, buddy. Sorry. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I pre coordinated with John Smith, you know, like whoever it was. And he's like, all right, stand by. And he's like, all right, helicopter, come on. And, you know, and then I, you know, had to remain North of the field for a bit. And then, 
basically low, they would de hold departing traffic. And then I, I did a line north to south. And then I would stay on the south side and orbit for a second. And then they would hold departing traffic and I'd mow it. And finally, about midfield or something like that, they, you know, just didn't stop traffic. And then one time I had to do a go around because the Atlanta Falcons jet did a go around. They came in too hot and close to, uh, you know, a Delta or I don't know, some some other air aircraft and and they hadn't vacated the runway by their whatever uh, min, you know middle marker in a market i don't know whatever their go around point was and so i'm in the middle of a line and i'm looking at this big jet coming up at me and it's the atlanta falcons and i'm you know immediately start to turn back to the north and helicopter 503 whiskey turn north immediately and it's like i got it i see him no big deal but anyways <laughs> yeah no air airspace is uh is is definitely more challenging in uh, busier airspaces out of all the airspaces that you have flown in um is there a favorite or is there a, a least favorite um i i don't know that i would put it favorite or least favorite because they're all just different in so many different ways um for example uh when you go down to miami or or uh, palm beach or Kissimmee, orlando it's so freaking busy if you take florida between May and October, and you add moisture and heating, you're going to get these things called thunderstorms. <laughs> you wouldn't expect that. Really? In Florida? No. Yeah, shocker. And they happen huh. every single day. And yeah. so the stress level gets uh, elevated for not only just the air crew, uh, but the ATC guys are trying to, to get you through there. Uh, and and 99% of them are super professional and getting you up and down through there. Um, they, they know what's working. They're, they can see the planes that they're getting through and the, the way they're going. And there's it's, it's funny because it's like uh, I'll call them up and I'll give them my call sign. I'll say, hey, I got a request. And, and they don't even ask me what my request is. Deviations left to right for weather approved. <laughs> <laughs> direct to whatever waypoint when able and i go okay cool uh, there you go talking to jack center miami center uh palm beach approach orlando approach uh, that's all real busy and you just have to know that going into it sure and and, and be ready um after again after doing it for four and a half almost five years now almost like having a conversation with them Oh, sure. Just like you and just like you and I are having. New York can be interesting. Boston can be interesting. Um, Washington Center can be interesting. And then you you think about how intimidating uh, they make the DCSFRA out to be, and it really isn't. It's no. super simple. Yeah. What I, what I like about the DCSFRA um, is my my take on it. You know, we would do a lot of like photo flights. And um, in the helicopter, like a lot of low level stuff and then the airplanes and stuff, we would do a little bit higher level, you know, 3000 above. But in, in the helicopter going down inside the 15 nautical mile ring and then inside the seven, you have to have a police officer on board. And it's like the stupidest thing ever, because the oftentimes they don't have dual controls. And so if I'm suicidal, like as a pilot and I want to plow my helicopter into whatever, like... <laughs> what's he gonna do like just be a witness like he's gonna be first at the accident scene you know like <laughs> he's on a police officer ride along yeah yeah and so a lot of times we would tell the guys just bring a camera and shut up you know like take pictures and the cops that we were working with were like super friendly and you know great stories in and of themselves but i found that um flying flying in the dc metro area was really nice because it is so intimidating there aren't the weekend warriors they're they're not the the doctors and lawyers out with their families you know on a joyride that don't know how to make radio calls everybody in the dc area are like meant to be there they're either united delta like whatever you know big carriers coming into reagan national or they're um, like U.S. Park Police or uh, the muscle, the Marines, or they're, um, you know, secret squirrel stuff or, you know, um, med flights, med star, whatever it is now. Sure, um, sure. You know, yeah. it was like everybody there yeah, was yeah, like I, super professional and like, every, I don't know. I felt like it was easier almost flying there than it was in like going up to New York. It was it was mayhem, like transitioning from like Teterboro or uh, LaGuardia, you know, going, um, you know, up the East River. And then you're on a CTAF frequency below a certain level, you know, uh, all that stuff. I and mean, it's just a lot more like, ah, you know, versus I, don't know. I was going to say the other fun part with the DC Metro or DC area is um, 
uh, you've experienced is the the helicopter routes that you referenced before, like uh, Route One, Route Four, you know, Cabin John inbound, you know, blah blah yeah. blah. Like just being able to say that, and then it's like, okay, my step down, I got to be less than seven hundred feet here. I got to be less than four hundred feet here, less than three hundred feet here, and you're yeah. like flying along, you know, <laughs> you're like, oh, there's the White House, there's the Capitol, there's, you know, the Washington Monument. All right, there we go. You know, you feel pretty cool, I, I gotta admit. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. Um, the When the helipad was on the northwest side of the Pentagon prior to 9-11, um, you used to have to come in and you'd fly right by the Jefferson Memorial, right oh, over the Tidal Basin. Yeah. And do a a sweeping left turn and usually you landed south sometimes we landed yeah. north uh, but um and then land on that helipad but you're you, you, that's exactly right you're going this is cool yeah <laughs> i love my job <laughs> yeah uh, again who gets to see this well yeah. we do oh yeah we do yeah one time i was at the pentagon um there's i forget the the interstate it goes like on the um, west side of the pentagon and there's kind of an intercha interchange there going to I think it's 110 yeah uh, so we were surveying that uh interchange uh for rcna and so i was doing like you know did it you know just mowing the grass going up and down that interstate and um i felt bad at the time and i still do now but like i was going like i was turning bank you know banking in the turns in the bell 206 sometimes you know if it's low like um like you're in a shallow descent or something like that you'll get the pop 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 you know the the real like blade yeah. slap type of yeah yeah and I, i'm like i'm turning and i look over and there's at arlington memorial there's a, like a funeral going on now uh, like, dick move bro. sorry no so, no you i know, apologize to whoever that is but you know uh, like, most everybody there is it's the sound of freedom yeah. even if it wasn't a military aircraft <laughs> yeah oh there, here's here's one for you we did a four ship uh flyover when i was at fort belvoir hmm. to um uh do the ribbon cutting for the fourth infantry division memorial at arlington oh wow um and it was a four ship huey flyover i was lead aircraft um somewhere in my pile of everything is a picture of that oh, that's and cool. i've got to find it but um when we were done we talked on the phone for a debrief with the the veterans that were there and they said sorry i'm actually getting a little emotional about this they said uh when they could hear the hueys coming there wasn't a dry eye in the audience Mm. and you think about these guys that fought for us in vietnam and heard those hueys to come rescue them and mm. save their lives and save their buddies lives and then they could see this yeah it's hardcore stuff good yeah. that's so just another memory yeah that's an awesome memory that's that's really cool how about to describe a flight that didn't go as planned, but it turned into kind of a valuable learning lesson? Well, it's funny you say that because I just had that happen within the last couple of days. Oh, when you're flying part 91 and most everyone can relate to this, your, your, your rules are a little bit different. They're not as strict as 121 or 135. You're not beholden to 12 hour, 14 hour, hell, 16 hour duty days. It's, it is just what it is. So we were given um, five legs on one day, three legs on the next day, and another three legs on the third day, all overnights. Mm. Well, we get um, on the second leg and we're going down to Florida and we don't even know if we're going to get in because the, the weather is just really, it's, it's heating up. It's the afternoon. It's Florida. So the whole time, my co-captain and I are just going, you know, hey, we're going to divert if we have to. We make it down there. Also, the first leg, we had a maintenance issue, mm -hmm. um, and we got it cleared. The second leg, the passengers were late. So we get down there, and we're just looking at weather going, I don't know that we're going to make it back. The second leg was passengers, uh, then a repositioning flight, another repositioning flight for an overnight. The, the weather turned super, super crappy coming back and we were in a position and if you think about a, a pc-12 it's got a service ceiling max service ceiling of thirty thousand feet are you ever going to see it it's anemic at 26 27 000 feet so you're not going to get there it's not a it's not a king air 
definitely not a 300 or 350 or even a 360. It's, it's just it, it with passengers and fuel, it's not the best performer. It's a great airplane. Oh and, yeah. And, but just goes slow and uh, it's not as capable as a jet or like even some of the more powerful turbo props. Anyway, we're looking at this weather and on board we have radar uh, XM next rad and our iPads with Stratus. And we're comparing the three things and all we see is this, it looked like a, a horseshoe oh. weather system and you couldn't go east. You couldn't go west. There was no getting through this unless you just plowed straight ahead and hoped that you found something to peck your way through. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, it's doing this number. It's getting Ooh. bigger. Some of the tops are 45, 50,000 feet. Jeez. I told my co-captain, uh, you know, hey, uh, what I think we should be thinking about now is landing somewhere and continuing the flight later. We ended up ended up getting, uh, we climbed and climbed and climbed and got to 27,000 feet and that was about it. And we went around, and as you're looking at it, you know, if you can picture it, this would be the um, left side, this would be the right side. I don't know how you're seeing it. Uh, we scooted around one of the lines of thunderstorms. Mm. Oh, and there was lightning shooting out of those clouds like mad. And yeah, uh, going, eh, there's another strike. There's another strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, we creep around the corner. We see this blue hole. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I go, I go to him. I said, is that blue sky or is that just a really light gray? <laughs> because it's as blue as the ocean and we went and it went right through it and got out of there so that goes to aeronautical decision making um you know constant crm uh it's remember augie's saying yeah. is it legal is it safe and does it make sense yeah yeah um fast forward to the next day we're getting ready for an afternoon departure out of an austere airport deep creek lake um, okay to golf four uh gare county and so we overnighted there and we're getting ready to go the next day we call for fuel and when we got there we were pre-flighting the aircraft and we saw the line crew and uh, we said to a particular person we're going to get you a fuel order here in just a minute we have to go look at what we have on board figure out our fuel load and we'll give you a, a, you know how much we want to pump you know 30 Minutes go by, 40 minutes go by, and Eric and I are inside finishing up looking at weather and flight planning and waiting for our passengers. And the fuel truck pulls up in front of the FBO. I went, oh, yeah, Eric, did you give him a fuel order? He goes, no, I haven't. I'll do, I'll do that right now. Oh, no. So he goes and he says, hey, um, we're going to take X amount of gallons or X amount of pounds, in this case, per side. And I hear the line guy, and I'm in the next room over, and I hear him say, oh, you guys are topped off. <laughs> Mother of God. <laughs> and you can hear the needle being drug across the top of the vinyl record. <laughs> Excuse me? And uh, so that turned into us trying to decide what we're going to do in an austere environment, but there's not defueling capabilities. <laughs> there's not 55 gallon drums that are empty just sitting there with a pump and you can just yeah. like start pumping gas out. Of, I mean, so there were, we were out of options at this point. We were too far forward on the CG. So Eric and I couldn't get in the airplane and go fly. Oh no. Um, if we had passengers or any baggage on the airplane at all, we would have been over the rampway. So our decision was to get in the airplane and taxi 300 pounds of fuel off. Sure. What's the burn rate on the uh, PT6? So in cruise, four or 500 uh, per hour. And when you're taxiing, we're getting 160, 170. So if you do the math, <laughs> that's a lot of taxiing, right? That is. So... Uh, we're taxiing along and I'm in beta because I don't want to burn the brakes out. And uh, we're just doing high speed runs on the runway and then taxiing off. So there's cooling. Well, about the sixth or seventh lap that we do, we hear this loud pop and I, I, I kind of instinctively knew what it was. And then we started to list up to one side and the airplane became uncontrollable. 
So, of mm. course, the brake fuse blew and did what it was supposed to do. It the brakes overheated. It blew the tire to keep us from doing any more damage. So now we're overgross, flat tire, <laughs> barely made it off the runway. <laughs> And the passenger was just about ready to get into his car to come to the airport to fly away with us. You know, the unexpected will happen. Uh, you you can't plan for that sort of thing. You, you know, there's you can armchair quarterback my decision making on that all day long. There there was just no other way we could have gotten we could have gotten rid of the fuel and gotten the airplane in the air. Yeah. Um. So, uh, maintenance crew comes. A crew came out from there, and then our crew met them and. 2.30 in the morning, they got everything fixed. They got the wheel changed out. And next morning, um, my passenger and his people had already gotten a car and driven back from Western Maryland all the way to their house uh, in Virginia. But um, that's, just, that's just one example. I mean, the other examples, me and Gary blowing the front tire in Greenland, you know, it, it, you don't expect it. But then the other thing is also remember, if you're ferrying an aircraft uh, over the North Atlantic in in any distance, make sure you've got cold weather clothing. Oh yeah, did you guys wear those uh, Gumby suits? No, <laughs> we both we both agreed, and it was, it was something Augie said to us. He's like, if you're going to try to put those suits on, and you're going down, he's like, it's better just to put your feet on the yoke and push it over and be done with it. <laughs> like, because I mean, it was it, it was funny watching Gary get into it, but he's. He's a nimble little sucker. Yeah, he, he jumped right in it, and then it took me about a half an hour to get mine on. And then I'm not going to. None of us flew in it. I mean, there we were yeah. supposed to, but well, you're you're kind of accepting the risk at that point. Like in you're in the middle of the North Atlantic in February. You know that survival suit maybe it helps you survive an extra an hour and a half, maybe two hours. But let's be real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is going to be kind of a weird question because uh, much of your adult life has been um, involved in flying or have had flying experience. But the question I had was, um, how has your um, how's flying changed your perspective on life or influenced your day to day decisions? Yeah, com compartmentalizing that that it's really that's kind of two questions in one. Um, I heard somebody the other day. And this is kind of a weird answer, I think, but I think it's appropriate. There, there's no other country on the face of the planet that that I could have had these opportunities. Mm. I'm, I'm just there. There just aren't. I'm, yeah. I mean, even when I was in active duty in the army, we would work with the Brits and um, the Canadians and who are the South Koreans. And uh, I remember particularly this young enlisted Canadian soldier came up to me and he goes how did you get into flight school? And I told him, you know, there's an application process. Usually we, most of us had experience either in the military or outside of the military flying that strengthens your um, chances of getting accepted. Hmm. And he goes, we, we don't have that. Hmm. And they're more of the, you know, Royal Canadian Air Force. You go to the right schools and you get into their version of commissioning sources and, um, then the other question I got from one of the Brits was how in the world did you become a warrant officer? Our warrant officers are like Sergeant majors that are about ready to retire that mm. get a commission because they're just really, really good at what they do. Yeah. So I kind of explained to him, no, it's not like that. <laughs> so, um, how has it shaped my life or influenced my life? The, the opportunities to learn how to fly, mm. uh, absolutely course corrected me and in several ways maturity discipline uh you know the sense of responsibility you know you when, when you're even if you're just doing a solo flight as a private pilot uh student you're the pic your, your decisions make it work or don't make it work yeah uh, so um just the problem solving and the and the, the the task oriented stuff really just made me think about everything i do differently Mm. Uh, the second part of that question, I kind of already answered, but I, I am so fortunate to have had these opportunities. Then you think to be able to do it for you know, most of your adult life as a professional is even more surprising to me. It's, it's more surprising to friends and family that knew me when I was younger. <laughs>
they're like, you do what? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, a lot to that. And I think, you know, if you think about opportunities for younger people nowadays, uh, regardless of what the market is like for becoming an airline pilot or a private pilot uh, for, you know, in a professional sense, or a helicopter pilot or whatever it is that you're doing, there's so many opportunities. There's scholarships, there's AOPA is doing it now. Julie and ProJet have always had their career expo. Mm. There's literally thousands of dollars being handed out to kids. And I know I'm kind of jumping off the, the or derailing from the question a little bit, but no, um, great. just, you know, if, if somebody's trying to figure out what they're going to do as an adult and they may or may not want to go military, uh, that's not always the best option. Sometimes it is. When you're in the world that we are in, Ryan, it, it, it's it's not just you and me as pilots or you and me as educators in aviation or you and me as, you know, just pals talking about it. There's maintenance positions. There's catering positions. There's air traffic control. Um, I forgot how what ungodly amount of money they make right off the bat. Yeah, they make good money. So I don't know that I... I don't know that I necessarily, I mean, I think about that all the time and I think about the opportunities I've been given and I think uh, what a great industry it is for anybody that's young that wants to get into it. But uh, also I, I, I don't know that like when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is what's my schedule? Am I on the books today? And if so, how am I preparing? And it's not really even preparing that morning. It's the night before possibly mm -hmm. even a day or two before that. But uh, did I call the FBO? Did I ask them to pull the aircraft? Did I, you know, uh, is a catering ready to go? Um, what's the weather look like? Uh, setting the expectations for the passengers. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's that constant processing of information in, information out. Yeah, We don't think like the average people. I don't think so. I think we are driven differently. E even when I'm on vacation, I'm going, I hear an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Yeah, the other... They're going. Yeah, I did that the other day. We were at um, it was a bachelor party, and we were sitting around a campfire, and uh, there was a, a helicopter flying around. And it was um, like a local sheriff's department, so he had like a searchlight going. And I, every time you know it would go by, I'd be like, hmm. it, it, "It's it's called AA." dhd or whatever it's a, 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 attention yeah a hundred percent but one of the things and, and, and I, i'm glad i remembered to say this uh there's an admiral that gave a commencement speech to one of the academies um or maybe some rotc and he goes the first thing you should do whenever you wake up and this is what we teach our navy seals is make your bed hmm. you, you know that's the first thing you need to do and you've just automatically sent yourself into a a series of decisions and chain of events in that day that are going to set you up for success. And it's, it's something as simple as that. So uh, I took that to heart because I'm, I'm not the tidiest person in the world, but one thing I do every morning is I make my bed, whether you need to or not. I know I can walk out the door going, if somebody, if I go get run over by a truck or something, my friends and family aren't going to come in and go, good God, Dan. <laughs> 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 oh my god new guys in the corner uh, puking his guts out <laughs> all because you want to save a couple of pennies on some brake pads right <laughs> my focus especially when it comes to just my professional world is all about everything that is circling around being a pro pilot yeah not to disparage any any of your comrades in arms in uh in the airlines but i would argue that you earn your pay versus them simply because you are actively involved in not like all aspects of flying so not only like the flight planning and the responsibilities and roles that come with uh decision making and you know clearances and clearance limits and all, all of that stuff but then you're also like catering and then like booking hotels where we're going to sleep you know making sure that your clients are taken care of and their odd requests and and stuff like that too you know single pilot or, or two pilot operation it's like it's all on you you have you work for your pay you know yeah you get you get paid well but you also work for it where is like i don't know i don't not to shit on the airlines but it's like everything is handed to those guys in a silver yeah, platter. Yeah. It's like, all right, here's your manifest. Here's your yeah, uh, fuel load up. Here's, you know, and then, oh yeah, we've already loaded your flight plan into, and then we've already cleared you. You're cleared to blah, blah, blah. 
and then just all you got to do is click you know the mic a few times make an announcement and then push back and then flip some switches do some levers and and then autopilot on and then go back to your ipad <laughs> all right it's a little bit more complicated than that i'm sure but i don't know that's my opinion yeah and you know and, and that's that's for anybody coming up in this industry you know it's a it's a personal decision yeah i think um you know now that the hiring feeding frenzy has kind of come to a little bit of a lull uh there's not a lot of there's a lot of cfis out there that missed the boat and not, are not going to get hired right away mm. uh they're sitting at 1500 hours and going how come i don't have a job well the world's a little different now industry's changing I think it's up to people like you and I to to let some of the younger children's know that um, hey, there's other opportunities out there. You don't yeah. have to do the bag drag through a terminal, and you know, while it's really easy work and you get to look cool and wear a funny hat, and you know, that's not the best life. I think even though I'm in this, in, the, in July in Palm Beach, throwing you know 20, 30 pound bags in the back of my airplane, sweating like a pig. I have a personal relationship with most of my passengers and I know who I'm flying with every single day. And his name's Eric. Yeah. And if Eric goes down the way um, and does something else or retires or whatever, then it's going to be whoever. And I'm going to be flying with that person Yeah. in the airlines. You absolutely don't even know if you're going to fly with the same person once or, yeah. or, or more than once in your entire career. Yeah. Unless you get to the upper echelons or something like that, yeah. where you're like number three and first officers and you pick your flights that are always the same, you know, like whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Which, it, you know, goes to the whole conversation about standardization, but we're as standardized, if not more than, than those guys are. Yeah. We do this. We do everything exactly the same way every single time. Yeah. Because uh, you're supposed to, I mean, that's yeah. just what makes sense. Yeah. For, for the future, for Dan, what, um, aviation related goals do you have? Don't do anything stupid. <laughs> I kind of want to do my helicopter CFI, even if I don't ever use it just sure. because love to be that proficient. Sure. I, I don't know if that's practical or if it'll ever happen, but most recently they said to me, when you go down to flight safety, you're going to do your single engine ATP. Oh, all right. And I said, okay, all right. Well, it comes down to a couple of days before I'm getting ready to leave for flight safety. This uh -oh. is five months ago. Uh -oh. They're like, oh yeah, by the way, we've got your check ride scheduled for the, the last day. I went, okay then. <laughs> well, I, shoot. I studied this much. Oh no. <laughs> and uh, it's an add-on, so there wasn't a written. There's all this stuff, and there was a lot of confusion. They were talking about me having to do my ATP, CTP. I'm going, I've already got an ATP. I don't need to do that. Um, there's all this confusion. And then, um, so I called my guy down there in Dallas, who I, I've done a lot of flight training with, and I said, can you give me the 411 or the, uh, you know, give, give me the Intel debrief of what it, to expect when I go down there and he's like, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'm like, That's the worst thing you could hear, but also very nice. <laughs> no, really. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously asking you what do, what do I just, I'm not going to tell you. And I literally walked in cold and, and had a conversation with a guy. He really did it really smart. Um, for those of you, if, the, if, if anybody sees this other than you and me and their DPEs, um, the way he conducted the uh, the oral part of the check ride was super awesome, and I'll okay. I'll, what, I'll explain it. Is. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. <clears throat> so there's a Pilatus has a pretty good video, and Flight Safety also developed a pretty good walk around pre-flight. But he literally started it. Here's point number one, and it's right outside the cabin door. And he goes, "All right, well, talk to me about the cabin door." is there a light associated with the cabin door? Yes, there is. What happens when you turn it on? Well, it stays on for five minutes. And, and what else does it do? Well, it goes out after five minutes, so it doesn't burn your battery. Well, what does it run off of? Well, it runs off the hot battery bus. Mm. <laughs> you know? 
And then it, it turned into talking about the leading edge and the trailing link gear and how we refuel and how much the fuel capacity is. We, we did a pre-flight yeah. and walked around the entire aircraft and covered mm. all the systems. And he's finding out what I do or do not know about this airplane. Sure. Then we did the flight and it was a full-blown ATP check ride. And nice. I, I smoked it. Good on you. And nice that I would say to anybody going up for a check ride, is you you should be doing nothing different in your check ride than than you do every single day mm. and if you don't have the knowledge get it do some self studying get 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 in the books and understand what in the heck you're doing yeah that's going to be the difference whether you get through an emergency or not or a check ride or not <laughs> yeah yeah no that's really good uh as you become a professional pilot a lot of times you you're taking ownership of your own education you get beyond yourself and say not everybody knows everything all the time when they were born you know like it's okay not to know things but it's not okay to sit on your hands and wait for somebody to spoon feed you it's like it's the onus is on you as a professional pilot saying hey i'm not i'm a little weak in this area let me go study this area you know that was one of the things i respected about our old um boss uh george like he'd be flying the tbm or um uh, you know, with the G1000 or something like that. And he would come in and for hours at a time and sit down with Gary and be like, Hey, I don't understand. How does it transition from the missed approach into the, you know, so on in like, he would deep dive because he understood like, okay, I'm deficient in this area. I'm going to go after that. And I think that that also is like maybe a, a thing that I learned for myself and I would recommend for, you know, people that want to become professional pilots is like you, you were talking about, you, you probably hit the books, even though you had studied zero, you were probably reading the POH and reading up on the systems and stuff like that, especially for an ATP check ride. But yeah. Well, I was mm-hmm. doing that incidentally for the, the, the training process anyway, cause I'm going yeah. there for my current. Yeah. So I'm like the books for that, but, uh, yeah. but, but it wasn't like, you know, um, <laughs> the, the the first ATP check ride. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where it was like, ah. <laughs> oh, let's talk about uh, over your career. You've taken a number of check rides, both in the military as well as the FAA. In for somebody that's never taken a check ride, what advice would you give them? Don't under prepare and don't over prepare. Uh, I would say that that that's one part of it, and the other part of that that I think of when I when I put students up for a check ride, I expect them to bring a lot to the table. And by that, I mean, they have to do, they have to go home and get in the books. And if it's the Cessna training course that you're getting into the modules and just doing, you're working your way through those. If it's, if it's Glime or Martha and John, you know, watch the videos and and pay attention, take the notes, ask the questions. But if you don't come to me for each flight lesson prepared for that, that particular flight lesson, then, then you're telling me that you're not going to be successful on the check ride. So my advice for someone that's going up for any check ride is just understand, first of all, the task conditions and standards. Uh, in other words, get into the now the ACS and understand what it's saying to you and be able to talk to that for each task that's that's put in, put in front of you. So just have an understanding. And if you don't, ask the questions. And, and the, the last bit of advice is don't ever, ever rush your way into a check ride if you don't think you're ready. Hmm. That's a sure way for you to talk yourself out of that check ride uh, and the success of that check ride. Cause you're going to go in there. You're not going to be confident. You're not going to be prepared there. A good DPE uh, is going to smell it out in a second. The, all you have to do is ask a few questions or just you know, look at how the person's acting. <laughs> you know, it's, oh yeah. It, 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 there, there's a lot of psychology behind this. Yeah. Uh, I guess the, the the big thing is um, it, it's just that it's 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 just a, a process that we all have to go through to obtain a certification, hmm. and it, it's nothing more than that. It's not. Um, I mean, I would be more nervous about like an airline interview than I would be a check ride because you have a lot more hanging on that. Yeah, I'm I'm more nervous about getting up and pre flying an aircraft and making sure that we got good weather. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't every single flight a check ride of sorts? Ah, uh, touche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
but I can fly the aircraft again, so it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but did you die? It worked yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's fine. How can you over prepare for a check ride? Yeah, I guess there really isn't such a thing when when you got to strike when the iron's hot. If you're not taking a check ride when you've met the you know the minimum hour requirement and all the conditions for you being eligible for that certificate. Whereas if you're spending the time counting how many rivets are in a Cessna 172 SP 1998 model with uh, Bendex King legacy. Yeah. You, you know, when you're going, all right, so I know that answer. Yeah. Yeah. But no, you can't true. explain uh, what, how, what the, what the process is to recover from a stall. Yeah. And the air mix of it then you're, you're 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 not seeing the forest through the trees uh so i guess my thing is that i've had students that have been super super into the weeds on everything and 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 really brilliant about everything yeah. and they do fine but i would just say that i don't agonize over <clears throat> um things you can't i see your far aim on on right behind you over your left shoulder if if you can't if you can't tabulate that and look up what you need to know in yeah. a second or two, you don't have to have the damn thing memorized. No, yeah, yeah. I think that was the biggest shift for um, like CFI uh, check rides. Um, you know, in some respects, is is an open book, and the answer, you know, to a question is, you know, like I don't know, but I can find that out for you. You know, in a moment, that is acceptable. Whereas, like on a private. You know, it's a little bit more like, you know, you, you kind of need to know, like, how many cylinders do we have in these in this engine? You know, how does a carburetor work? You know, like the big stuff, you, you need to know that. But then, you know, like the how many rivets are in the left wing of a 1992 Cessna 172 SP? I don't know, but I can go find that for you. Give me a minute. You know, like. Yeah. So you're stuff. out there. The thing <laughs> yeah. Is Sharpie. Yeah. yeah. And you have to put a little black dot on each of the rivets so you don't have to count them over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I lost count. I got to start all over. Uh, you just write the number next to it. <laughs> <laughs> if you Knowing what you know now, if you were to start over in the aviation career, would you start with helicopters or airplanes? I, I don't know that I would pick one over the other. Uh, and and it's, I think it's circumstantial for me. From my personal perspective, fixed wing was certainly more economical. Uh, had I not had the military opportunity, I wouldn't be a commercial motorcraft helicopter pilot. Well, uh, maybe I don't know. You never know what opportunities might have presented themselves. But um, you, you know, without that opportunity, I I, I, I love them both. I mean, I, I, you know, and people ask me all the time, and I'm not I'm not kidding you, all the time. Which do you like better? Mm. If I want to carry some troops into a hot LZ. You're damn right a helicopter works. The Pilatus not going to work so good. <laughs> Might not be able to take it off again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so um, you know, apples and oranges. But um, yeah. you, And then the other thing is when you fly, you know, 48,000 pound, 99 foot rotor tip to rotor tip helicopter with two mm -hmm. AFCS systems that are basically like an autopilot. And, you know, you're, you've got, I mean, we had some ridiculous amount of shaft horsepower per engine. And again, I, geez, I haven't looked at those numbers in forever, but they're they're yeah. massive engines. Yeah. Um, and they can the damn thing can deadlift twenty thousand pounds. So when you when you have that kind of background, jumping into a two hundred six or something is kind of like, uh. <laughs> yeah. it, this is fun and it's familiar. But um, I remember yeah. Gary and I were talking about that just the other day. He's like, you know that bar that runs across the back of the seat of a 206 because it's uncomfortable as hell it just it digs into you and yeah you're always you know you're always on the anti-torque pedals because yeah how squirrely the damn thing is and i, I would still do it and, and i think it's still fun but i my, my answer to you is i probably more than likely would have done fixed wing first again but i, I love them both yeah oh yeah no they're a lot of fun i i think that's a good analogy apples and oranges you know like yeah, I, I always uh, use the, the idea of um, if you want to get from point A to point B relatively quickly, um, then airplanes. If you want to like leisurely take your time and see the country go by, helicopters, you know, like you're, you're down low. You're not talking to people, you know, in the majority of the country, obviously in major met metropolitan areas, you're talking to a lot of people. But 
you know, like I ferried uh, little R44s back from Torrance a number of times and like just out, you know, just in the middle of nowhere and you're just cruising, you know, 500,000 feet off the deck and you're just like, you're watching the world go by and there's, there's something fun about that. But then there's also, you know, something nice about being up at 35,000 feet with uh, climate controlled and uh, nice relaxing seats that you can slide back in and, and relax and yeah, my back spasmed just a little bit when you mentioned the bar in the 206. That, oh, <laughs> it still hurts, man. Jeez, that thing. Yeah. Final question. What uh, what advice would you give uh, anyone that is looking to start out in aviation, uh, whether helicopters or airplanes, uh, or if you want to be specific, either one? What advice would you give uh, somebody that, that doesn't know uh, anything or, you know, doesn't know much about uh, flying and, and is like, oh man, I want to do that. How do I do that? Wow. Um, you know, the, 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 the several answers just popped in my head immediately. Uh, but I would say that there's so many resources available to a young person wanting to get into the industry these days, uh, the career expos. I mean, the, the, the internet, I still, I've been every day working on getting to the end of the internet. I still have not found it. <laughs> I've been trying. <laughs> it's somewhere out there <laughs> but i mean if you think about i mean even back when you started the the computers were things and the dial-up modems and you still get into uh, pilot resources and there's nothing i mean left to the imagination right now as far as getting into uh educational resources for for students i would say that if i were to give my son or daughter or a nephew or a friend, a friend of a, or a daughter of a friend that lives next door to me or the son of a friend that lives next door to me, I would say, look at the scholarships that are available through STEM programs. Hmm. Talk to, you know, if they're in high school or even in college, there's gotta be a department that has something to do with aerospace and aerospace education. There, hmm. There's, there's not, I mean, you throw a rock and you're, you're in it. Um, you're hitting somebody that's talking to kids about aerospace. There's civil air patrol um, is, you know, think about what you think, what you may about the civil air patrol, but that's another opportunity for kids to get exposed mm -hmm. uh, at very little cost. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot to be gained. They get orientation flights and they can move themselves into, you know, even learning how to fly with them, there's go out to the airport and ask questions. And, you know, if it's something like a discovery flight, like they call it a disco flight at Aero Elite. We used to call it the adventure flight and aviation adventures. Yeah. Uh, go take one of those. And while they're kind of expensive, you can do a half an hour, you can do an hour. You can go back if you want to. The only thing is, there is a restriction on how many hours you can log as a discovery flight. <laughs> 247 hours as a discovery flight huh <laughs> weird there's there's no shortage of resources for anyone that ever thought to to get into the industry in any capacity and i you know julie's um aviation career expo that was sponsored by projects moving venues are going to hagerstown this year oh okay what uh do you want me to ask it or do you just want to no there's two there's two in particular that i kind of got all excited about oh sure shoot um uh, one of them was uh any favorite aviation related books or movies that have inspired you oh all um, right so there there are two that came to mind one i read before i even started flying and it was the right stuff by tom wolf and if you if you haven't read that book from the moment you start reading about you're talking you're reading about this test pilot who augers in and you know they fight his flight helmet and it's got like this you know, half his brain in it and <laughs> so I'm like you know, you're, you're you're like Gurp, i'm doing this <laughs> this is fun <laughs> yeah but then you know the space race and you know all the astronauts and the test pilots yeah. who drive their corvettes and all that it was just a, a great book um the second one is fate is the hunter i don't know if you've read fate is the hunter by Ernest mm -hmm. Gann. it's a it's he's an aviator he joins an airline very, but this is in the 20s, 30s, flying DC 2s, you know, 6,000 feet east coast, inches of ice on the wings. They would actually take the mixture, basically pull the mixture all the way back and then slam it forward again. 
So the engines would go bang and it would get rid of all the ice that was stuck to the engines. <laughs> That's one way to do it. <laughs> Holy hell. But if, if um, and again, this is kind of more for anybody that's coming up, the, those two books, mm. you know, and I'm not an airline guy, but the right stuff absolutely inspired me. The, the um, Fate as a Hunter uh, is just one of those great reads that you're like, holy crap, how did they do this 50, 60, 70 years ago? Yeah. What do you mean we don't have flight aware? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean? What, what do you mean I can't go into four flight and do my flight plan right now? What do you um, mean direct enter enter is not a thing now? Right, yeah. Where's <laughs> where was Garmin Logic 70 years ago? Yeah, yeah. What's the most breathtaking view you've witnessed from the cockpit? It had to be when we were and 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 this is the answer I came up with when I was pre-reading before we started talking. If you've never flown in Alaska, mm. um, there were two episodes. One, we were under night vision goggles and the Hale Bop comet was flying overhead. Oh wow! So, night vision goggles light up everything anyway. So you got this comet streaking across. Then the Milky Way you can see clearly. Oh wow! To boot, the Aurora Borealis. All the northern lights were kicking. Dude, and we were just sitting there, and I remember we were on the top of this mountain, and we were waiting for something to to do, and, and just sitting there, flight idle. And again, you just one of those moments where you go, "Who gets to see this stuff?" Yeah, and the the second Alaska one was we we're coming from Anchorage back to uh, Fairbanks, and we're at ten thousand feet in a Chinook. You look over to the left, and another twenty five or twenty thousand, another ten thousand feet higher than that is the top of Denali. Wow! So you're looking at this twenty thousand foot mountain plus. I mean, it's like twenty thousand and three hundred feet or something like that. Uh, but yeah, we're at ten thousand feet, and you're just looking at this monstrosity you know, towering above you. And, and it's like, wow, we, we get to see that stuff. Other people don't. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Um, if I had to fly, if I got to fly any aircraft in the world. Yeah. The Lockheed Constellation. Oh, really? That's my man. I think it's the prettiest airplane that has ever been built. It's just so damn sexy. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Well, Dan, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. This has been my pleasure. An absolute blast. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste.